Hi, so this is just going to be a quick presentation of the Hotelling Downs model, which is sort of a special case of the median voter theorem. Sometimes you'll see it presented as this being an example of the median voter theorem. Um, we're not going to go through the theorem exactly here, but we're going to go through a quick example of how the model works. And this is from a book called Formal Models of Domestic Politics by um, Scott Gelbach. So this is, you know, his work, just presenting it. So what this is going to be, it's, it's going to be a model of sort of electoral competition uh, between two parties, and they're trying to get the most votes to win an election. So this is going to be a simultaneous game of complete info. Um, we're going to have voters and political parties. The political parties are going to be the sort of main agents here. The voters are just going to be sort of behaving deterministically according to their preferences. But we're definitely going to focus on the choices of the parties um, because of some assumptions we're going to make about voters, which we'll talk about in a minute. The idea is that politicians are going to choose policies along a one-dimensional policy space. So this could be from, this is represented by the real line. It could be, you know, constrained to zero to one or negative one to one, but we're just going to pretend it's the real line here. And they're going to choose a policy uh, represented by a point on the real line, and voters are going to vote for uh, whichever party uh, has a policy that's closest to the voter's ideal policy. So you could think of this as, you know, single issue voters who only care about one thing, and you're able to conceive of this policy along sort of a continuum, and whichever uh, party announces their policy is closest to that voter, they're just going to go to the polls and vote for them, and there's nothing else to it. So it's simplistic, but it, it, it's interesting to analyze. So we have agents, uh, parties, uh, parties A, or party A and party B. Their strategy space is going to be a choice of a point on the real line. And each party uh, prefers a higher probability of winning to a lower one. So pi x sub a, x sub b is going to be the probability of A winning, conditional on these two strategies being played by the parties. Um, and obviously for uh, party B, it's just going to be 1 minus this function pi. And they're trying to, you know, if you're party A, you want this to be as high as possible. So um, when we're thinking about voters, we need to give a little more info here. So the voters are going to just exist on a continuum. So, you know, sort of we're working with infinite voters, which is a little weird, but let's not worry about it. Um, each one's going to be indexed, you know, I and each voter is going to have an ideal point. So, you know, X1 is going to have a, a point on the real line that represents their favorite policy. X2 is going to have their favorite policy. And these are called ideal points. We need to assume that the distribution of ideal points is continuous and strictly increasing, and that's just going to guarantee that a unique median exists. So there is, you know, you could line up everyone's ideal points, and there's going to be a point that is exactly uh, in the middle of that. The voters have Euclidean preferences, which just entails that they prefer nearer policies to farther ones. So their utility functions are the negative of the absolute value of, or just the distance between the chosen policy for uh, when they're looking at a specific party. So this would be either XA or XB when they're trying to decide, and their ideal point. So this is going to be maximized at zero, right? And then it'll get more and more negative the farther away you are. Um, and then we have some more behavioral assumptions about voters. Uh, voters are sincere, meaning that they're not going to sort of lie. They're not going to uh, claim their ideal point is something different than it is. They're always going to vote for the candidate who says they have a policy that's closest to their ideal point. And if they're indifferent, they're going to abstain. They're just not going to vote. And the election is plurality rule, so the party with the most votes is going to win, and we use a fair coin flip to break ties. Uh, so this allows us to give structure to this uh, probability function here, this uh, pi function. So remember, this is for the probability of party A winning. They're going to have a probability 1 of winning if the number of voters who prefers um, their policy A to policy B is greater than one half, they will have a probability of winning of zero if the number of voters who prefer 
B's chosen policy to A's chosen policy is greater than one half, and then it's going to be just a coin flip otherwise. And then, you know, you just flip all these signs for uh, one minus pi for uh, uh, party B. So we want to think about uh, what predictions we can make and sort of what analysis we could do here. And the sort of obvious choice is thinking of a Nash equilibria. Um, the idea is that each party is going to uh, come up with a best response. So they're going to think of what the other party could do, and they're going to think of, given that party doing that, what's the best thing I could do? So they're going to find best responses. The Nash equilibria is going to be when both parties are playing best responses. So we're going to start with party B. And um, let's say that A chooses a policy that is below the median. So that would be just represented here. I, I didn't write x sub a. Hopefully it's clear what's going on here. So if you're b, um, we should be able to think about what would be best in this situation. They can win for sure. They can maximize their probability of winning. They'll have a probability of winning of 1 if they choose a policy that's anywhere closer to the median. So that would be anywhere within uh, this little bracket here, right? On this side, it's closer, and on this side, uh, it's going to be closer too. So if we look at this, they're going to capture sort of all of these voters here. And because there's 50% of the voters here, they're capturing, you know, 50 plus some number on this side. They're going to win for sure. Same thing over here, right? They're going to, they're going to split half the votes. If B is here, for instance, they're going to split half the votes between A and B, and then they're going to get all these votes. And because A is uh, farther away on this side, B is going to get more than 50%. Um, if B chose a policy on the other side, but exactly the same distance, so exactly at this line, then that would be a coin flip. They'd have a one-half chance of winning. If they chose the exact same policy as A, they would also have a one-half chance of winning. And if they chose anywhere sort of farther away on either side, they would lose for sure. So their best response, uh, given that we know they're assuming... Um, a is playing some point below that, they're going to look at the distance and they're going to choose a point that is within sort of uh, that distance on either side of M. That's going to be their best response. So here, you know, just for this specific case, this whole interval would be um, a best response and it would be an open interval. Um, in the case that A plays a policy uh, greater than the median, the argument's the same as uh, this, you just, you know, flip everything to the other side. And when A plays a policy that is exactly the same as the median, the only best response is going to be to also play that, because everything else would be a probability of winning of zero. At least they would have a one-half probability if they chose the same strategy. So when we look at A, um, we're going to look at the best response for A. It should be clear it's symmetric, right? So this the argument's going to be exactly the same. Their best response correspondence is going to be um, completely analogous. You might have to flip some um, some subscripts and stuff, but it's going to be exactly the same. So basically, they have symmetric strategies uh, when we're in a Nash. And they're both going to be playing their best responses. So hopefully, we see that there's only going to be one Nash. It's going to be unique, and it's going to be both of them playing the median. So you could talk through this formally, but I'm just gonna we're gonna show on this uh, on our little line here how that would work. So you know, let's say B thinks A is gonna play something down here, then they would always win by playing this. But A knows then that it wouldn't be a good idea because they would lose to B. So then they would play something closer, and then B knows that A is smart enough to do that, so they would move closer, and then you know, so on and so on until you get to where they are all playing the median. And that is going to be the unique Nash equilibria. So, you know, this is a simplified example, but uh, there's more complicated versions of this uh, that are gone through in the textbook that this is from that I mentioned. And um, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks.